Galatians, you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. Who called the Galatians into the grace of Christ? Paul did. They were removed from Paul. And so these false teachers, the various teachers, and no doubt a lot of them were believers too, but they, they just they, they went away from what Paul taught them, okay? So, so that's, that's, that's in a nutshell the background as to why the Corinthians were still such a carnal mess. When, when Paul was there with them initially, he was there probably a minimum two years. It says a year and a half, and then it says a great while, again, over in Acts 18 there. So he was with them probably at least, at least two years or so, maybe longer. And then he, he moves on, and then word gets to him later on that, man, they're just not doing good at all. Question. Look over to uh, chapter 2 here. When Paul was at Corinth, notice what he says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, this time verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now my question is this. Did Paul know anything beyond, at that time, uh, uh, did he know anything beyond Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Probably yes, no. Did, did, he, did he know? What do you think? Probably no. not. No. Now, now, when does he, that's an interesting answer. I wouldn't have expected that answer out of this group. But, okay, so when does, Paul, when does Paul go to Corinth? Who remember in the book of Acts, where is it? Book of Acts, where is it? So 18? It's Acts 18, 18, isn't it? Okay. So Acts 18, is that Paul's first apostolic journey, his second apostolic journey, or third apostolic journey? But you know? Second. That's the second apostolic journey, okay? Which means that's after Acts 15. Mm -hmm. Did Paul have a lot of the information of the revelation of the mystery by Acts 15? Yes. So then he had it by Acts 18. Yeah. So it's interesting that, that uh, I'm asking, did, did Paul know more than simply Christ and crucified at the time he said, Clark, the answer the answer is, of course he yes. did. That's why I was kind of surprised at the response, okay? Very interesting, okay? So, um, I, I, we, we mentioned the comment in, at the, at, in Sacramento about, at the conference there just a couple weeks ago. You know, when, when we depict the chart, we, we fold it out like this because it was a mystery, right? And it, when, you, when you do it this way, it, it can imply that Paul got all of the revelation of the mystery in one setting. And, of course, he didn't. No. When you read from Acts 9 to Acts 28, the Apostle Paul sees the Lord at least five different times. One of which is the passage you referred to earlier about him being caught up into paradise. Remember that? Okay. So the Apostle Paul, he gets installments of the information over an extended period of time, maybe 20, maybe 25 years. So it would be... It might be better, I'm looking for something I here, could use here, here. a little, uh, it might be, that, that could work, let's see if this works here, let's do it like this. It's not as big as it, what we have. Okay. It might be better if we did the chart something like this, instead of folding it out like this, as though he gets all the information once at one setting, it might be better if it was like this, he gets a little bit of the information, then a little bit more, then a little bit more. And then by the time he writes Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, now he's got the whole thing. You see the, you see the difference there? Mm -hmm. So what I'm driving at is that when the Apostle Paul was at Corinth, he clearly knew more than simply Christ and him crucified. Well, if that's the case, why then did he limit, when he was with them there, why did he limit the preaching to Christ and him crucified? Well, he tells us why. Yeah. Look at what he says over here in 1 Corinthians 2. Look at what he says. He says, it, I'm going to jump ahead for time's sake to verse 4. He says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. But real quick side note, when he says, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that, that's a classic verse that the Charismatics and the Pentecostals want to use to say, see, Paul was yes. going around going, poof, and he heals somebody, poof, uh, power, poof. No, that, that, the demonstration of the Spirit and of the power is the Spirit working through the preaching of the cross, the power in Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. You see that there? Uh, if you read the context, you'll see that that's what he's driving at. And then he says in verse 5, that. Here's why. Here's why Paul <laughs> chose to focus his preaching that car to Christ and Him crucified and, and get that issue down. Here's why he did it. What's the first word of verse 5? First word of verse 5, what is it? Yeah. That. Here's the reason. That's your faith. Your confidence, what you're believing in, what you're trusting in, what you're seeing with the eyes of your understanding, that your faith should not stand where, but instead it should stand where? The power of God. 
And see that phrase, the power of God, next to that verse, you need to have 1 Corinthians 1, 17, and 18 written down. Next to 1 Corinthians 1, 17, and 18. Look at those two verses. 1 Corinthians 1, watch verse 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 says this, For Christ sent me not to do what? What's it say? 117? Baptize. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that prayer is foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is, not was, but it is what? What's it say there? Power. See, the power of God, the end of verse 18. Go to chapter 2, verse 5, and what's the last statement say? Chapter 2, verse 5. Power of God. You see that? Make sure you see that. In chapter 2, verse 5, That's chapter good. 2, verse 5, when he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What's the power of God? It's the preaching of the cross. Everything, spiritually speaking, the start of our, our Christian life, and living the Christian life, it's all based upon whether or not our confidence, our faith, is in the power of God, i.e. in the preaching of the cross. Amen. Who, who knows Galatians 2.20? Uh, Everyone no. should know it, right? Yeah. Ready? Let's say this together. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And you know the next verse also, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is, not was, but is dead in vain. If righteousness come by the law, listen, your King James Bible is the only one that says it this way. If Christ is, if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead. That means He didn't even rise from the dead. The word is dead. If righteousness comes by the law, it would have been unjust for God to raise Christ from the dead. Yeah. It would have been totally unjust. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Well, when the Apostle Paul says in that verse that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, he wanted the Corinthians' faith to be based on, established, and rest in the starting point because the old saying, never get too far away from the cross. Galatians chapter number 2, verse 20, is both our justification and our sanctification. I am crucified with Christ. Well, that's Romans 6. Nevertheless, I live. That's Romans 8. Yet not I. That's Romans 7. Right? The things that I should do, I don't do. The things that I do, I shouldn't do. <laughs> but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh. Not the one I used to live, the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith, and what's the next word? Faith of, of, of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Sanctification, learning more and more His life in me. See that? So the background around the Corinthians here, Paul was with them. He taught them. He focused on the finished work of Christ and, and their position in Christ. And then, and then he moves on, and quickly they're turned away by all these other teachers. But of course, the, the Corinthians were willing participants in allowing themselves to be... You realize, that's the problem with the church as a whole. They're willing participants in the false doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They keep going to the churches. They keep giving the money there. They keep supporting the ministries and so forth. Mm -hmm. They're willing participants in the thing. Yeah. You know? It, it could, it could uh, you know, so many of those preachers, you could shut them down overnight <laughs> if the people in those churches said, you know what, you're not teaching the Word of God, we're out of here. Man, shut them down overnight. They get, their mortgages are way too big. <laughs> okay? Yeah. What do you think about that? You know? Church so the, the Apostle day. Paul, he, he really wants the, the, their, their, their attention to focus on, on uh, Christ crucified, the preaching of the cross there. And these, these 10,000 instructors, they were leading them astray. Now go back to chapter 4. Go back to chapter 4. Watch this. Watch what the solution is. Go back to chapter 4, verse 15. No, okay. Chap chapter 4, verse 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ... Yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So what's the solution? Well, here it is. Wherefore I beseech you, be followers of who? Me. That's amazing. What's the answer to the Corinthian confusion? 
Follow Paul. Follow Paul's doctrine. And then he says in verse 17, for this cause. For what cause? To get you to follow me. See the cause there? He says, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of, what's it say there? My ways. My ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. That is just <laughs> crystal clear to an eye of anyone that wants to see it. Yeah. The solution for the confusion, the Corinthian confusion, is to bring the believers back to Paul's ways which be in Christ as he taught in all the churches. Well, listen, Paul isn't alive today, and now there's Timothy, so we can't, you know, text Paul and say, hey, Paul, can you tell us what to do? You can't text for Timothy, say, send Timothy to our conference. What do you do instead? You've you got his writings. You've got his epistles. You've got the doctrines. Even Peter, in the last thing he writes, says, if you've got to go figure out what, what God's doing, it's kind of hard to understand. You've got to go read Paul. Amen. The answer for the, for the confusion in the church today is to get back to Paul. You, you, and, and Satan understands that. That's why he gets these people off track. Now, that's kind of the picture. And it's in this setting that the Apostle Paul brings up the details about the judgment seat of Christ. What, what, why, does, why does he put the details about you know, the gold, silver, precious stones? What he has to, why does he put that in this setting? Why isn't it in Ephesians? I mean, it applies to the Ephesians. Why isn't it in Philippians? It applies to Philippians. Why is it here? It's here because the Apostle Paul wants the Corinthians to know how important it is, the doctrine that they're listening to and believing. The, the background, the backdrop here is all this confusion. They got a proper start from the Apostle Paul himself, but then these 10,000 leaders led them astray with this other doctrine, basically the Word of God wrongly divided. And Paul says, listen, what you're believing, it's going to be reviewed one day, and you need to make a decision now about the outcome of the judgment seat of Christ. It's an open book test, guys and girls, is what he's saying. The answer is here, it's in my writings. So go read Paul's epistles and build that doctrine into our soul. Let's look at the details. Chapter 3, again, if you would. Look over to chapter number 3. At, I'm going to start at verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8, he says this. Now he that planteth, uh, 3 8, he says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And he's going to tell them the details of what that's going to look like. How you're going to get a reward according to your own labor. He, I'm going to jump ahead to verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Okay, so what's one of the first things we know about the principle of that every man's going to receive his own reward according to his own, own labor? What's one of the first things we can discern based upon verse 10? According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. What is it? What's one of the first things? Grace. What's that? Grace. It's going to be measured against what? What's the verse say? The grace of God given to Paul. Paul is the wise master builder. I want you to hold that verse and go to Ephesians 3. One of the first things to grasp is that the review at the judgment seat of Christ, the measuring stick, the standard by which the body of Christ, every member of the body of Christ is going to be judged, is going to be according to the information that Christ gave to the Apostle Paul. Look over to Ephesians 3, and, and, and make sure you make a connection here. Look at Ephesians 3. There's a phrase here. Notice how he says it in Ephesians 3. I'm going to start at verse 1. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the... Look, look at the phrase the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me. Do you see the phrase there? Everybody see that phrase there? So, so according to Ephesians 3 verse 2, what specifically was given to Paul? What's he say there in the verse? What's it say? What's it say there? See that? Exactly. So understand this. When Paul talks about the grace given unto him, he's not simply talking about, well, Jesus showed him a little bit of favor. Remember back in the days before the flood, it said, but Noah... Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so people say, well, see, Paul got grace, Noah got grace. What's the difference? Well, are, are you kidding? <laughs> there's, like, there's a whole dispensation worth of difference. When the, when the Apostle Paul in that verse, he says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given unto me, 
you want to take that same phrase and go back over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 there. That, that's the picture. 1 Corinthians 3 at verse 10. He says, according to the grace of God. Well, what grace? The dispensation of the grace given the Apostle Paul. That's the measuring stick. That's the standard. It's Paul's epistles, which you and I have today. Romans through Philemon penned by the Apostle Paul. Okay? So when he says back at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise, what? A wise master builder. What, what's that? A, what? What? A master builder. What, what's that? He's got the chief plan. Like, like, yeah, he's, he's like chief, chief architect. Yeah, he's like the chief ar architect. Mm -hmm. He's the, he's the senior gen he's the senior general or the major general contractor on a construction project, right? And and when he says as a wise master builder, he uses that idea because God's the one. God gave him the blueprints. He's got the blueprints. Is what happened. Okay. So he says, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. That's what he, and he built it according to the blueprints, according to the plan. But then he makes a warning here, gives us a warning, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. You, wrote, you, you realize that Corinth building was happening. Some were saying, I'm of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. Oh, and some were saying, I'm of Paul. Building was happening. But they weren't all following the right blueprints. You, you can spend your life like Apollos. You can be eloquent in the Scripture, mighty in the Scripture, knowing only the baptism of John. And when you as a believer, you appear at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to be all wood, hay, and stone. Ooh. Ooh, big time. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can... You can there, uh, several years ago, there was... A, I forget the guy that did it, but it was real popular... Uh, um, to memorize the entire Gospel of John. And he taught people how to memorize John, which is not, I mean, it's not easy to do, but it's not that difficult in the sense that he, he, he taught them to do that by, you, you do it in pictures. As you read through John, in your mind, you're getting a picture of what happens in each chapter. It's really interesting to do. You can actually do it. It's really kind of cool, okay? But you, know, you can memorize the Gospel of John. You can memorize Matthew, Mark, and Luke and everything. But if that's what you build into your soul, your life, and your heart, and everything, and that's what you're telling other people to do, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not going to follow the blueprint that the Apostle Paul is teaching. You, if, if, you, if you approach the Bible with the chart closed, if I can say it that way, you, you might know lots of verses, be able to quote this verse and point to that verse and go to this chapter and so forth, but you know what? If it's not following the building process that the Lord Jesus Christ gave the Apostle Paul, there's going to be some problems at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's important to remember. It's, it's like the church as a whole, it's sad to say that, that really they're spending most of their time trying to put the believers under the law program, the kingdom program. Trying to teach them how to follow the Sermon on the Mount, for example. Or how to pray and live under the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6 there. Or how to interpret the parables as though the parables are us. Um, things like that. And which, which none of that pertains to the dispensation of grace. That's interesting. Well, notice what else he goes on to say. <coughs> he says at the end of verse 10, But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, understand this about that verse. That, that verse is one of the strongest verses in all of Paul's epistles. And there are a lot of strong verses in Paul's epistles about his unique apostleship and, and ministry. That verse, is, that verse right there is one of the strongest in all of Paul's epistles. Why? Listen. If you lay a foundation for, for something, what did you do? If you lay a foundation for something, what did you do? Getting ready to build on top of you're, you're, you're getting ready to build something on it. But the foundation that, provides strength to the structure. It provides strength? Good. What else? If you, if you laid the foundation... You're preparing the way. You're preparing the way. If you laid the foundation, it wasn't there before. If, if you laid a foundation... Listen, before this hotel got built, I, I don't know what was here, but I'm suspecting it wasn't here before. Right? Okay? <laughs> it wasn't concrete here to build, build a hotel on. So there's, maybe there's some trees or a river run through. The point is, they had to come across and clear the ground and, and then build the forms, the framework, and then pour the concrete. 
When Paul says, I laid the foundation. That is an absolute, distinct, clear recognition of, of his unique apostleship and ministry. He in that verse, when he says, I laid the foundation, he's not thinking of Jesus Christ back here in the Old Testament. The prophets laid the foundation of Christ back there. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Christ was being built on the prophets in the Old Testament. There was a foundation already there, already there. When, when, when the Apostle Paul says in that verse that... Um, Right at the end of verse 10. I'm sorry. See the second part of verse 10? I have laid the foundation. Then that cannot be a reference to the prophets. It cannot be a reference to Isaiah or Malachi or, or Moses or, or Psalms. It can't be a reference to that. Because that information was already there. And then when he says it, verse, he says, verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that's, that's as laid and taught by the Apostle Paul is the verse. That's the issue in that verse. He's reminding the Corinthians that, listen, you might be listening to Apollos, the Apollos-type doctrine. You might be listening to the type of doctrine Peter taught, Acts 2.38. You might be listening to the doctrine in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the problem is that's not the foundation for the present dispensation of grace. So if you try to build upon this foundation, that doctrine... It isn't going to work. Let me ask it this way. Is there any debate, discussion, question in Christianity today about, say, eternal security of the believer? You better believe it. Well, why? Why is that an issue? Because they don't what, if, if the Apostle Paul over here says having for, that we have the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. It sounds to me that that means you're like totally forgiven. And if you're like totally forgiven, then even any some sin you can commit in the future, God isn't even going to impute it to your account. So what sin is it you're going to commit that's actually going to cause God to kick you out? Well, they say, well, the sin, what, what if I decide to get out? That's still a sin. Well, I decide, I, by, own, by own free will, I'm going to choose to reject Christ. Yeah, Christ already died for that sin. Go ahead and do it. You're still in. You can't get out. That's so the, good. the Apostle Paul is saying, you're already totally forgiven in Christ. Look at Christ crucified. What does Christ crucified say about whether or not when Christ said, it is finished, God's reply from heaven is, yes, I raise you from the dead to answer that. Right. See that you there? So, so why would when the Apostle Paul says things like total forgiveness, we're accepted in the blood, we're complete in Christ, why would people in, who say they believe the Bible, why would they be confused about eternal security? Give me a verse, why? He that endures till the end. He that endures till the end. Faith without works is dead. So where are they picking that stuff? You know what they're doing? They're closing the chart. Mm -hmm. They're taking wrong doctrine and building it upon this. Or what they're doing, actually they're taking this information and discounting this. Mm -hmm. They're saying, well, that's Paul. He's kind of a secondary apostle, so it's not that important. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening. You know? So it matters. Uh, how When Paul says in that verse, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And he's talking about his ministry. Laying the foundation of Jesus Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, not according to prophecy. That program was already there. Right. Now, so watch what he does. Verse 12. Everybody with me so far? Okay. He says, Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Okay, first of all then, do you see the two categories? And, if, and so what are the two categories? What are they? Gold, silver, precious okay, stones. So gold, silver, precious stones represents what type of category? Good material. Good material, what else? Eternal, permanent. Yeah, something some of intrinsic value. Mm -hmm. because, because when you think about it, wood, hay, and stubble, that has some value, mm -hmm. right? If, you, if you're, if you're, uh, you're going to build a house, I mean, my house is built out of two by fours, right? <laughs> so I said, the wood, hay, and stubble, they have some relative value, but, but not like gold, silver, precious stones. If, if you, if we, do we have any dairy farmers or, or beef farmers here? You, you know, you probably need some hay. Mm -hmm. Got to feed those things. You know, even your bricks are made out of straw. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So the, you got two categories. One is like it has intrinsic value, but the other has no value 
when you put it through the fire. We don't have the time, but if you would just, you know, let's make the time. Go quickly to Proverbs 2. Go, go to Proverbs 2. Let's, let's make the time, and um, we'll ask for a special dispensation from our time hey, keeper back there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Look over to Proverbs here just really quick. Look over to Proverbs. Five minutes. Yeah, oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. You know, and I never did actually nod to start the clock. You know, oh. that. <laughs> okay, just real quick. You, we've, you've seen this many times, but this is just to reinforce it. Look at Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs 2. Proverbs chapter 2. Uh, tell you what, go to Proverbs chapter 3, then we'll come back to chapter 2. Look over to Proverbs 3. Watch this. Proverbs 3, verse 13. 3, 13. He says, Happy is the man that findeth what? Wisdom. Wisdom. And the man that getteth what? Understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of what? Silver. And the gain thereof than fine what? Gold. She is more what? Precious. Than what? Ruby. Did you just see gold super precious stones right there? Yeah. And what does he liken them to? He likens them to wisdom, understanding. Look at verse 19. This is the, the verse that Dino read uh, this morning, right? Verse 19. Look at this. See verse 19. He says, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths are broken. So those three things. Gold, silver, and precious stones in your Bible are a reference to a direct parallel to God's wisdom, God's knowledge, God's understanding. Well, where do you get that? Go to chapter 2. Go to chapter 2 of Proverbs. Watch this. Chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto, there it is, wisdom and applying thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. You see, you wisdom, knowledge, understanding. You see that there? Mm -hmm. Verse 4. If thou seekest her as silver, searchest for her as hid treasure, oh. then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of the Lord. Now, here it comes. Watch verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom. Where? What? Where? Where did God, verse seven, lay up sound wisdom for the righteous? Where is it? In His Word. Everybody say, when that verse says, verse six, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of His mouth. That's a direct reference to the written Word of God. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Man shall not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. God. In God's Word, God's Word is the wisdom. It's His wisdom. It's His knowledge. It's His understanding. You've got to dig for it. You've got to mine for it like you, like you would mine for and dig for precious stones, gold, silver, and so forth. See, it, listen, if someone told you, it, it, let, let's say you got a phone call from the county assessor uh, when you come back home on your property, when you go back home to speak on your property, and the county assessor says, you know what? I don't know if you, if, you, if you knew this or not, but we just discovered that that plot of land that you own, you guys just have a piece of property, right? They said, you know what? We just discovered on your on your property that, that, it, that it looks like from studying the geological formation of the rocks when we were home and early, that you, you guys probably have the, probably the richest deposits of precious stones <laughs> and gold, gold and silver right on your land. And we're the government, so we're going to take it over. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad they can do that. <laughs> uh, that that's true. Yeah, eminent domain, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> God's word is it's, he's screaming out to humanity my riches my, tr my, my knowledge my understanding it's in my word and if you'll search it out like you would pursue looking for, for treasure gold, silver, precious stones you'll find it it's no wonder Paul uses the word study mm -hmm. that's, <laughs> that's what you got to do but if you'll study this out you'll find that gold, silver, precious stones. Now go back with me over to 1 Corinthians 3. So Paul says, you see the two categories. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. We find the gold, silver, precious stones. They're in the Word of God, and they're in the Word of God rightly divided. You see that? Okay, now watch what's going to happen in verse 13. So, verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Now what's the it? The it's his work. Okay? Because it, his work, shall be revealed by fire. Now next to that verse, write down Jeremiah 23, 29. 
Jeremiah 23, 29, where he talks about, is not my word like a, like a hammer and like fire. He says, my word's like a fire. And I'm saying that's what's going to happen. Okay? He says, again, verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Because it, his work, the doctrine, whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, whatever, so it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what? What's our next word there? Sort. 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 It is. Question. If you build gold, silver, precious stones compared to wood, hay, or stubble, which one on the outside is going to appear to be a much bigger in volume? The wood, hay, stubble. The wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, I, if I had, say, a gold cougaran or a gold coin in my pocket, I, I don't, by the way. Quickly, pass the plate. Let's <laughs> go. No, I don't. But if I did, you wouldn't know it, right? That's why I pass the plate. Maybe someone else does, right? But you, you, have a, you have a gold coin in your pocket. I don't know, what's gold worth that uh, an ounce? Maybe it's, it's like about 1200 an ounce, something like that. Whatever, whatever it's worth. The point is, yeah. you, you can have a, you know, $1,200 worth or whatever it's worth in your pocket. No one would see it, but it's there. It's got intrinsic value. If you took that same dollar amount and you bought, say, $1,200 worth of hay, yeah, that's, that, that be, that that, that's hay. not going to fit in your pocket. No. So see one looks like it's got a great big impression. And the other one you can hide maybe, in the Maybe if it's organic, eh? Maybe it's organic, I said, yeah. <laughs> it really would be a thought, right? You know, so there's a man who knows, by the way. Okay? So when he said, the issue isn't the quantity, the issue is the quality. What, what difference does that make? Day or night. The Corinthians had 10,000 instructors. They had all kinds of quantity of information, but they were still totally, completely carnal Christians. Because what was being taught to them was not the Pauline information to, to, to help them properly be edified in Christ crucified. And these 10,000 instructors certainly weren't teaching them the revelation of the mystery. See that? So he says, if any man's work abide, which, verse 14 now, he says, Verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive. And then what does it say there? Notice it's, it doesn't say rewards, plural. Sometimes you have, you see, you have the idea that, man, I'm going to have so many crowns in heaven, I'm going to have to be walking around like this kind of balance salt with crowns on my head. No, no, that, that's not what's going on. A reward. Now, when Alex talked in his message about what were the third heavens like and what he was talking specifically about the New Jerusalem, you think about the heavenly places. Both these gentlemen mentioned earlier about the heavenly places, how there are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, and might there are at least five of them. They're and based on Ephesians 6, so actually it could be two more. And then there's everything in this name. By the way, that thing about five, Satan's five I wills, Christ five, being, being uh, humbled, uh, humbled and so forth. Interesting, the, the five, thrones, dominions, prince, powers, and powers. That's kind of interesting. There. Well, when he says a reward, that's what it's going to be. Let me use an illustration. I, I'm running out of time. That's why I'm not turning all the verses. But remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was on the earth and, and he, he, he left to his, some of his servants, he left one guy 10 pounds, another guy 5 pounds, another guy 1 pound. Remember that illustration? And then when the Lord, he goes to heaven, gets the kingdom, returns, and then he calls back those that he left uh, responsible with, with his pounds and everything. The, the, ten, the guy with 10, what does he do? Remember what he does? His 10 went out and made 10 as well. Okay, so what does he tell the guy? What does the guy get? He says, uh, well done, thou good and faithful servant, be thou ruler over, he says, 10 cities. Right. Okay, wait, wait. So when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom on the earth, is it going to be a literal kingdom? Yes. Right. Is he going to sit on a literal throne? Yes. Are the twelve apostles going to sit on a literal throne judging the twelve tribes of Israel? Yes. Will the nation of Israel be over the Gentiles on the earth? Yes. So when the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns and he says, be thou ruler over ten cities, he really meant it. Wow. He really meant they're going to get like Chicago and Seattle and Portland. And, and Ooh, I wouldn't want those cities. <laughs> <laughs> really and truly, that's what he meant. 
They're going to get their reward according to their labor, according to that blueprint, their plan. When the guy that had five pounds, he goes and makes five, he says, they're ruler over five cities and so forth. They're going to get, they're really and truly going to be kings and priests over the earth. Mm -hmm. They're really going to get those cities, really and truly. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because at that time, my, my guess is the government's going to probably run a little more efficient, right? <laughs> okay? Than the way it runs now and everything. But that's another old story. Well, what I'm saying is this. When the Apostle Paul says that if any man's work abide which he hath built upon, he shall receive a reward, members of the body of Christ are going to be given by God the Father. You're going to get a throne, a dominion, a principality, power and or might. You're going to get one, one of those. It's really going to happen. As long as the doctrine inside of you winds up being gold, silver, precious stones. It's really going to happen. That's, that's, what, that's what Paul's teaching them. He, he's teaching the Corinthians that what you're believing now, your conduct, your lifestyle is supposed to be the result out of what you're believing. What you're believing now is going to impact your position in the heavenly places. It makes a difference what we believe. How often do you hear Christian people say, oh, you, you guys about the King James Bible, and you guys all this dispensation, all you do is fight all the time. And I just, oh, it's trouble. We're, we're not trying to do that all the time. I mean, we, don't, we don't wake up each morning and say, who can I fight with today? <laughs> you know, I, you, you said something at Sacramento. You know, you don't have to attend every fight you're invited to, right? <laughs> Man, that was saying with lots of bloody noses and black eyes kind of a thing. But understand this. Our life matters to God for eternity. He would not have had the Apostle Paul write this information in the book of Corinthians if it didn't matter. The doctrine we believe, the doctrine that we teach, that we build into our soul, what we're learning to trust and how we're learning to trust Christ as a believer, not just as a lost person getting saved, but as a safe person who can learn to trust Christ in our life. That's all. That gold, silver, precious stones is the whole process there. It really is. When he says at verse 15, um, and I'm, I'm quickly running out of time, aren't I, right? Oh, she stopped counting now. Oh, good, okay, good. All right, okay, good. All right, it says at verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he, you talk about getting burned. You, 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 you wrong and divide the word of truth, you're going to get burned at the judgment day of the Christ, if I can say it that way. But don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Look at what it says here. He says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So, so the loss in that verse, is that a loss of a person's justification? No. So it's not a loss of their eternal position in Christ, correct? What's it a loss of? The reward. The reward. Thank you. It, it's, it's the loss of either the throne, the dominion, the principality, the power, the might. It's the loss of one of those. Which means they could have had it. Right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big universe out there. There are lots of them out there. Right? The, the Bible talks about that the body of Christ, we're going to judge angels. Judge not in the sense of condemn, but in the sense of rule over. Like the twelve apostles are going to judge the twelve tribes. Twelve apostles are not going to condemn Israel. They're going to, they're going to serve as the chief governors and, and rulers of the, in the kingdom with Christ. He says. So we as members of the body of Christ, we're going to judge angels. We're going to rule over the angelic race. And the Bible says to angels that they're innumerable in number. Well, that would imply that the body of Christ has got to be more than one or two or seven people. Think about that? It's gonna, and it's going to function as a body. So the, the thrones, the dominions, the prince powers and powers and mics that are out there, God wants to give those things to members of the body of Christ. Well, not every member of the body of Christ is going to get those things, not because God didn't want them to have it, but because what they built up in their soul, what they believed, what they followed was wood, hay, and stubble. Simply put, they're not going to get those because they're not equipped to function in those. Instead, what they're going to wind up getting initially is this. Look, look with me over to Ephesians chapter number uh, 1 here. Look at Ephesians 1. <coughs> look at Ephesians 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. And watch what he does here. Uh, Ephesians 1.21, he says this, Far above all, that is, he raised up Christ and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, Verse 20, and far above all, above all, uh, principality, power, 
and might and dominion. He doesn't mention throne in this chapter, but he does mention in, in Colossians 1, remember? Okay. So he says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And then what's the next one? Every name that is named. There you go. See the every name that is named. What, what are you seeing there, by the way? You go throne, dominion, <clears throat> principality, power, might, and then every name that is named. What, what are you seeing there? The lowest hierarchy. Level. Yeah, you're seeing structure. You're seeing hierarchy. Okay? You're seeing hierarchy. What's happening there? So for those members of the body of Christ who, for whatever reason, wound up, doctrinally speaking, that it winds up being wood, hay, and stubble, then they're going to suffer loss of a reward that they could have had, but not loss of their soul. They're still in the body of Christ forever. And to that I say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay? Right. right? Listen, remember I was raised as a Roman Catholic. When I was first introduced to the grace message, and this was shortly after I, came, I became a believer, um, I, I fought it. I did. I did. It just was too different than what, what and all my background was about Catholicism and everything. So I had a real different view of Scripture. I, I, everything was allegorical and so forth. But I really fought it for several months. And it wasn't until after that that I really came to, to, to really kind of grip with the... That I'm either going to have to believe God's Word for what it says and admit what He said, or, or it didn't. If, if, if God didn't mean what He said, well, then close the book, forget it. Believe what the Roman priests say. Why did you fight it? You know? What's that? Why did you fight it? Um, because it was so different than what had been taught in my Catholicism, my basic approach of the Bible. So it, when I when I read when when I read, I use glasses. Okay, and you reading glasses? Well, if you think about it, my Catholicism wore a pair of glasses. Yeah. It, it impacted my focus when I read the verses. Okay, and that's what happens. It really does. So let me try to wrap this up by saying this: what we the doctrine we believe now matters. First and foremost, let's make sure that we are building according to the, the design of the edification given by Christ of the Apostle Paul. So you study all of the Word of God in the light of where we are in the Word of God. Okay, that's pretty close, right? Okay, you study all the Bible in the light of where you are in the Bible. We're not back here, we're not out here, we're in dispensation of grace. And so you, all the Bible's for us, it's just not all to us, nor is it all about us. And we study this, listen, this, this is so, this is really important to grasp. This is not a contest. You, you know what I mean by that? Our flesh, if we misunderstand grace and the nature of grace and how all this works, then our flesh, when we see a passage like this, we're going to say, "What well, man, now, now I've got to go prove myself. Now I'm going to show God what a great Christian I am. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to show God, man, I'm... No, 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 that missed the point. That missed the whole point of this. Mm -hmm. the, the, the reward is not going to be something that we wind up boasting in. Just like salvation. Where is boasting then? It is excluded justification by grace through faith and sanctification by grace through faith completely, totally, forever excludes boasting. So when it comes to this issue of this re the reward here, it's not an issue of, man, i got to go prove to God what a great guy he got when he saved me and I'm going to go and you know, it's going to be me watch this on it. No, 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 that misses the point. That is all back under that performance-based system. It really is. Yeah. Well, if that's the case then, does God want to give us the reward? Mm -hmm. Does He want us to build gold, silver, precious stones? He does, doesn't He? Mm -hmm. So how do we pursue this and it not be the flesh pursuing that? It not be self pursuing? How do we do this? Living spirit. It has to be the spirit yeah. that opens our eyes. Yeah, it, 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 it is. It's definitely, you were talking about walking living in the spirit. spirit. Living in the spirit. Galatians 2.20. Yet not I, but Christ. Yet not I, but Christ. What is it? Yet not I, but Christ. That's the mm. fundamental thing to keep in mind about this. The reward is there. But let's not pursue that reward in the sense of, wow, what's what my flesh can do. Yeah. Lord, Christ, only anything of any value. Christ, you're the only one that can do it. Right. So yet not I, but Christ. Let's close the prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we could spend a little bit of time here today talking about this and really all day long re re rejoicing in the wonderful 
ministry and message of your grace given to the Apostle Paul for us in this dispensation of grace. And we ask God that as we've talked about these things, as, as we've sought to encourage one another in these things and allow your word to encourage our own hearts, that we'd be ever so careful always to, to be aware that our, that our flesh will take these things and want to boast in it and want to sometimes somehow imply that we're better than others because we've come to see these things in God. Oh, Lord, help us to understand that this is not the flesh at all. That we're just laborers together with you. We're ambassadors, both to the lost and even to other believers that don't see these things. And might we learn a little bit more each and every day the wonderful truth, the powerful truth, the, the, the liberating truth, that it is indeed yet not I, but Christ. In whose name we do pray. Amen. Amen.